Hello everyone, this is Glenn Kaiser from the Dolby Institute, and I'm thrilled to be kicking off another in our series of podcast episodes in conjunction with the Soundworks Collection. We've got something really special for you today. Making Waves is the first ever feature film documentary to focus on the art of sound design for movies. And it was my extreme honor to be invited to moderate the post-premiere conversation uh, after the film premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival with Midge Costin, the director of the movie, as well as three of the most legendary figures uh, in our business, Walter Murch, Ben Burt, and Gary Rydstrom. It was a really fun hour-long conversation, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Here it is. Sound designers and re-recording mixers, Walter Murch. Ben Burt. Gary Rydstrom. And our director, sound editor, and professor, Midge Costin. Midge, first of all, congratulations. Yes, yeah. yeah, I think I heard about this film probably seven years ago. <laughs> And we always, I mean, for years, we always said, you know, they, 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 they had that damn documentary about cinematography. Why don't we have ours about sound? Yeah. So you've, you did it, and you've, you've crossed the finish line. Congratulations. Yes. It's a lot, it's, you can see why it took so long. I mean, this, you know, because we're trying to take the whole history of sound, and we did 90 interviews. Uh, getting them down to, getting it down to like 90 minutes, essentially, is insane. Well, you teed up my first question perfectly, which is you have 90 years uh, of the history of sound to cover in 90 minutes. How did you hit on this structure, really on focusing on these three, these three gentlemen? Well, that was really my producing partners, um, Bob at Buster and um, Karen Johnson, and then also David Turner, that we all got together and just you know started to research the history. And then it was through the interviews and then really thinking about um, what are the really important moments that, so you know, it came to King Kong. And it was also, these guys are incredible historians, I have to say, so they really helped us because there isn't a lot of information about sound. You know, I think we all feel in the sound world, the cinema, sound world that we're a little bit forgotten. And everybody thinks of, even when I went to, was at USC, the first, the, the, um, the, the classes were still like visual storytelling or something, you know, visual something. And I just asked, could we put oral in there? You know, we started, so, so somehow it's like, it's just so subliminal that you don't think about it. So even it was hard to find, right? It was hard to find archival material of sound editors or sound people. And I mean, Ben is a real historian. Um, for its sound, and it's just like it's hard to find this stuff. And Larry Blake, I think, might be in the audience too, who's done a lot of work. Um, well, I, I can echo that. Um, I spent 11 years running Skywalker Sound, working for for George Lucas, and I, I got to say, some of my happiest moments of that time were uh, impromptu lunches down in the uh, in the tech building, having lunch with Ben. And it was Ben, I remember, who talked to me uh, one day about the sound design of King Kong that I'd never even thought about before. Walter was there one year, I think, cutting on Jarhead, and we we were able to have lunch a few times, and I you know got another you know master class in the history of a film, and I learned absolutely nothing from Gary Rydstrom. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, Apocalypse Now is at the top of my mind right now. It's the 40th anniversary. Obviously, there was a, a big screening last night, um, uh, and, and so I'm. I'm Pointedly not going to ask Walter this question. Uh, I want to ask Ben and, and Gary, what, why Apocalypse, why has it continued to have such a huge impact um, aesthetically on soundtracks for film? Wow. Um, well, of course, at that point, you know, after Star Wars, there had been an, an awakening on the part of many producers in Hollywood that sound did matter in a, in a commercial way. And we had uh, put our uh, toes in the water in terms of doing a multi-track presentation and, and, and six-track. But Apocalypse, you know, took the they took the th thought of theorizing. Well, what what really is the next step? Is it just accepting a given technology? We were really conforming to what had been done. Uh, some of the stereo films from the '50s, the Cinemascope process, and its its advantages and disadvantages, but 
uh, apocalypse, uh, aside from its aesthetic, of course, I'm not the expert to tell you about that, but it, it was very thoughtful and it was very, it, it, it took the idea that what, can be, what we can present in a cinema can be taken to a much higher level in terms of spatiality, the idea of the, the four corners of the room. We were able to do surrounds on Star, on Star Wars, but we knew that they probably never get played correctly. So we were pretty conservative, and we didn't know any better what. what but was do that because of technical time. limitations in the theaters at the time? In theaters at the time, because there were some theaters equipped. There were theaters equipped for with a mono surround channel, but it was very unreliable, and we uh, it may not get played correctly anywhere. And there wasn't really a way of enforcing that except under the most strictest conditions where you'd, all the Dolby people and everybody would go there at one time and force it through. Um, uh, the idea of presenting something where you gave equal weight, really, to as much of the room as you could cover, that was really fell to the apocalypse. Uh, genius is there. Um, so it, it, it raised the standards and showed that it could be done. And so it just took us to the next level of planning films from the start, knowing, well, it's likely we can get in many locations in theaters, uh, surround uh, and subwoofer presentations uh, with that kind of result. People in the movie talked about emotion all the time. And so Apocalypse was a case of a movie that that used sound for emotion, all the way in, from a psychological point of view. Plus, it, it, I was in film school at the time, same film school these two guys went to. And, um, uh, between Ben's work in 77 and Star Wars and then Empire in 80 and Apocalypse Now, sound was so cool. <laughs> so that, the influence they had on me and a lot of people was it was something that attracted, I think Apocalypse and Star Wars, attracted a lot of people to that field because you could see what the possibilities were. So it had an effect on movies, but it had an effect on the people who went into movies. Did you learn something from that? I did, Ben's? thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, well, you brought up USC, this, this place where you all went, and Midge currently teaches. Uh, what, what is magical about USC for sound? Walter? At the time that we went? <laughs> we, and, uh, and, and, it, and it still continues to be, right? I, I remember that uh, we, were, we were permitted to break into the sound department at 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, mix films from 2 o'clock in the morning to whenever Ken would come in. You know, we'd have to get out like an hour before. This was, this was Ken Mira? Ken Mira, who was head of the sound department. And uh, they knew perfectly well what we were doing, uh, but the idea of this subterfuge uh, added a certain kind of uh, excitement and spice to what we were what we were trying to achieve. So there were rules, but there were rules also there that were being broken. And that was something that when we started American Zoetrope up in San Francisco that we just wanted to continue. And uh, I, I think it's significant also that uh, the three of us and, and many of the people here in, in the film are working in San Francisco, which is not Hollywood. It, it, we were 400 miles away, and in a sense, we were our own little ecosystem, and we had to develop uh, ways of thinking about the technology and the art of doing sound that were different. We didn't have the life support of a community around us, which is what would have happened had we been based in Hollywood. Well, this is the way you do it. Um, but we then had to produce work that was able to stand up against the work that was being produced in Hollywood. So there was a, there was a kind of a rivalry, sort of Florence-Rome rivalry between San Francisco and, uh, and, uh, ho and Hollywood, which is healthy in the, in the long run. But that, that geographic separation, I think, was, was significant. But interesting and ironic that you all started in Los Angeles and then right. ended up in Northern California doing yeah, this yeah. iconic work. Yeah, but that, the really important point about Northern California was that the barriers were, there weren't, there weren't the divisions of labor. Yeah. I mean, I was free to be part of the, I could comment on picture, I could sit in on screenings, I could, yeah. 
Uh, I could do I could go out and do production sound. I could do uh, post production sound, and yeah. and also you know have access to the director on a daily basis to get feedback or ideas or suggestions. Yeah, I mean that was yeah the, couldn't have done it exactly. That yeah. was what we were used to in film school. Yeah, when we went out into this slightly chilling atmosphere of Hollywood, the way it was in the late '60s, early '70s. Everything was very, uh, you know, as was very well indicated in the film, that it was very uh, cut and dried. This is how you do it. You use these sound effects and you have to get them done by such and such a date. And it was all done on a, on a business level. And uh, we, we hated that. And so one of the ways to uh, avoid that was simply to get out of Hollywood into an environment where uh, there was not that kind of restriction going on. You didn't have you didn't have those those really rigid union classifications, and yeah, there, nobody told you you couldn't mix sound at two o'clock in the morning. Right. Yeah. Th there was a union in San Francisco, but uh, I, I wasn't a member of a union for many many years, and uh, but the, the union that was there was simply the theatrical union. Uh, they they were hardly concerned about film at all. Your so stage hands. Whatever you're doing in film, you just do it. We don't want to know anything more about it. So we're all union. <laughs> Absolutely, but to, but to your point, um, th there weren't those. You know, there was nothing telling you as a sound editor you can also mix. So that was sort of a, an interesting yeah. Northern California thing that happened, which is now infiltrated back into exactly. Los Angeles. Yeah, but that's uh, also a, a concept that happens. There's no coincidence that these three went to USC because USC you do production sound, you do editing and you do mixing. And I think that that's one of the underlying factors is that you really understand sound because you go through the whole process. It's not, it's very divided. It's like we never, when you're cutting dialogue or something, you never see the production sound. You never used to, although now it's coming together more. Um, and I just want to say that Dean Elizabeth Daly is here um, in the audience who is um, Dean of the USC Film School. And a lot of, and a lot of the, um, our crew actually is, um, USC, um, and I just want to say we love NYU too because it's nice to have. Two. <laughs> yeah, the idea of a crew system, school. which we experienced the crew, there, yeah. was was fantastic. You'd be a director on one film and a sound person on the next film, and and that that got you used to being on a crew, and also uh, wearing different hats and and testing yourself in different areas. And that we left with that equi you know equipment that we could. Well, we might end up. I think many of us wanted to be auteurs and make films star in our own superhero movies. <laughs> well, you uh, did. Well, yeah, I got that out of my <laughs> system early. This was your premiere, too, yeah, by right, the way. it was. <laughs> well, I think there was the L.A. Science Fiction Festival oh, in 1973. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We showed that. Uh, but uh, that's what I loved about it, is the, the crew system, because it, it, it forced you to learn to work as a group, but you also had a chance to... to uh, have the, the focus on different roles. That was really important. And, and then the, the faculty, at least at that time, I don't know what it's like exactly today, but they were a little bit like the studio front office. They would <laughs> offer resistance. Oh, that's going to be too expensive. You can't do that. Or your script idea is not, there's not the ending we want. And I, at first I resisted that, thinking there's something wrong, but I realized it was great training for later on. <laughs> because you, it's a collaborative effort, and you have to compromise with your who's paying the bills and who, who may know more than you. And, uh, and certainly that's always the case in the real world. And uh, so it was good, excellent training. There, there, just, there was a specific problem in uh, Hollywood sound in the division, very strict division between sound editing and sound re-recording. And the, the analogy with a picture would be if the the lighting director was an entire separate organization from the camera operator, and that they had completely independent uh, criteria. And so in, in sound, the sound editors would, be, would have prepared sound, uh, having certain things and ideas, and the re-recording mixers would say, well, that's fine, but I'm going to do my thing here. And so each of them felt that they were being that betrayed by the other. <laughs> you know, I'd be, I could mix much better if these sound effects editors had done a better job. And the sound effects editors were sitting in the back saying, we did all this work and he's ruining our work. <laughs> um, 
again, if, if you think of the camera operator having the freedom to ignore what the lighting director did. And so, again, one of the ideas about moving to San Francisco was to merge those two things together. And the person who prepares the sound environment of the film should also be the person who can do the final mixing of the film. And the technology came to our help, aid, because it had progressed to the point that it was inexpensive enough because of the transistor that we could actually start to do that kind of work ourselves. So in addition, these two would do sound jobs and be a picture editor, which is another rare combination of Well, that's the most approach. fun of all, and because see, they're really not different. You know, I mean, picture editing, you're laying out information on a timeline, right. a sequence, and that sequence could be imagery as well as sound, and we know that they're not exclusive by any means. And uh, those opportunities are pretty rare. They are an independent film and, and uh, not right. so much in the studio product still. So for, the, for Walter, for you and Ben, when you're cutting picture and also um, you know, doing, doing sound on a film, I'll em embarrass Walter slightly by saying, I believe you're the only person who's ever won two Academy Awards for cutting picture and sound on the same movie on the same night for The English Patient. Is that correct? Uh, <laughs> and in, at the BAFTAs in England for the conversation. And oh, the, yeah, it, yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. So are these parallel processes that are happening in your head while you're cutting picture? Are you not thinking about sound, or are you thinking about sound while you're cutting picture? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ask, a, ask a stupid question and get a short answer. No, I, my, when I'm cutting picture, I perversely turn the sound off so that I'm just looking at the images. I'm, I'm intentionally making myself deaf because I then can study the body language and the subtle things about the visual cues of the actors. Um, and after a couple of passes constructing a scene, then I'll turn the sound on and I'm, I'm uh, surprised by some of the mistakes that happen, but also delighted by some of the mistakes that happen because uh, there's a general rule, uh, I think, with any language that you can always understand more of a language than you can ever speak. And what we're trying to do always is to get the film to speak to us. I think that was said a lot in this, in this film. That, you know, tell us what you want is, is what we're talking about the film. Ironically, we're trying to make the film at the same time as we're trying to get it to tell us what, uh, it, what it wants and needs, which is beyond what we can intentionally think about it. You've also, all three of you have directed. Uh, feature films, some documentary and episodic, and, and Gary obviously animated. How did, how did your background in sound affect your direction uh, of your projects? I thought that we would get a perfect production track without any flaws in it. That, that, that was a, this was a young indie television series. And I, I did have the benefit of having a British crew and we're shooting in Europe and they were much more attentive to getting a good track, you know, getting the dialogue, but also since we were always filming on location in old stairways and buildings in Prague, they did a great job of getting production effects in, you know, that were balanced and they kept the generator away from the, the shooting and, and, and really produced a really great track to start with. Um, but I did, like most directors, give it up in certain cases, like there was just a time to get the right sound. And you'd say, well, we'll just loop it later, something of that sort. So I did, I did sorry, I confess a little bit of that. Um, but directing took, for me anyway, so much of my mind that it was tough to also uh, do all the little things in sound that I would have dreamed of in a quiet time beforehand. The first time I directed anything was a, it was a short film for Pixar. And I did my own sound. And the whole thing was a, a wonderful experience. I, I loved every minute of it. And I got to the mix, which I did. Screwed it up. <laughs> did a terrible job. Had to go back and redo it several times as if I turned that part of my brain off and that that talent went away. I couldn't really, what I was missing, what it turned out, is when you mix, you know, when we do sound, when you work on a film, you are filtering through a director. And a director is important as someone, and you want to be able to go too far, 
you're going to experiment and go too far and then have a director pull you back or, or redirect things. That's what they're doing. And so when there was no one behind me when I was mixing to be that filter, I was lost. So never do that again. <laughs> it was, um, speaking of directors who do sound, it's like one of the reasons we have Ryan Coogler in the film. We were able to get him because he's probably the busiest person on the planet right now. But he was a student, actually, before he did, before he directed the more advanced projects at USC, he did sound. And it was because he said it was the one thing he didn't really understand that much. And then he tells a story about how when he was booming, he had put the boom and he'd listen, he'd put it over to the director, with the actor, whoever was talking on the set. And he got all this information. You know, because he was really, he was eavesdropping, but it was <laughs> letting everyone know. Hopefully they took their mics off before they went to the bathroom, but they, <laughs> yeah. So it was great. I think younger people, too, um, they've been using cameras and stuff since the time they were about two years old. And they understand, uh, they understand how to shoot something, how to frame something, you know, how to light something, but they haven't thought about sound. And now they know, and especially if you're watching things on small, uh, you know, screens, the emotion is going to come from sound. And so they're, they're really interested. So now I get a lot of, you know, the students come in and, and uh, instead of sound being like, you know, something they don't want to do, it's like they're, they're wanting to do it. So. It's also something in film school that you realize, and I think people like George Lucas realized, is that sound can add a lot to a film where you don't have other means of, you don't have visual effects, you don't have a big budget. So, you know, THX back in you know, say when he did the student version of that, that Walter did the sound for, very dependent upon the sound for that movie. Um, and, you, and it's something that I always tell film students, which is pay it, use sound, because you don't have other tools to the extent that you do with sound. And you can do a lot of storytelling with it. You make that point really clearly um, with Saving Private Ryan, too, which is... You know, we don't think of Saving Private Ryan as a low-budget indie film, but but a lot of those same lessons apply. Which is, you're you made the point in the film. You're telling the story that happens outside the frame, yeah. in a way that was a lot cheaper than if Spielberg had <laughs> shot all that stuff. And he didn't choose to do that because it was he chose because it was a he wanted to have the visuals represent the human element. Um, and I there's I, I think that sound and picture work best together. Not always, but often work best together when they're coming at the same story from two different perspectives, two different angles. So they're not just adding. And a lot of bad sound is just adding what you're already seeing. A lot of good sound um, is the Alan Splett approach, the David Lynch movies. I mean, that's nothing from Alan Splett's soundtrack for Eraserhead is seen in the movie. It's all, it's, a, it's like a complete a different movie, but together they become something very rich. So using sound is not just reflecting what you see, but telling the same story from a different perspective. Yeah, there's, there's a very splittish moment in Godfather in the killing of Salazzo because that the screeching, roaring sound of the elevated train, there's nothing visual to uh, inspire that. It's just the restaurant is in the Bronx, so I guess you say, well, it makes sense that that sound is sort of happening. And yet, visually, there's nothing to indicate that. So in desperation, in a sense, the audience ascribes some of that sound to the interior state of Michael, which is uh, you know, a very intense moment, because not only is he going to kill two people uh, at point-blank range, uh, but he's also killing the dream that he expressed at the beginning of the film, which is, I have nothing to do with his family. You know, Kay, his girlfriend, this is not me, you know, it's them. And now he's diving into the cesspool of this uh, crime family. Well, don't you think that audience, no audience ever watched Godfather and said, what the hell is that sound doing? Did they, so that's, I never, I that's never saw a train track. Where's the sound coming from? That's the secret of this. You can, put, you can put bad things in, but you have freedom to put things on the soundtrack, more than sometimes we realize. And right. the audience is not going to sit back and analyze and say, well, that's wrong. Yeah. In that I mean, case, they take it certainly was the big lesson for me, because the, the films I'd worked on prior to that were THX and Rain People, and, uh, you know, they were little small films, and here was this big Hollywood film, and I realized, oh, you can, you can do that same kind of thing on these films and, uh, and make it work. So you, you, the, the general rule is push much harder than you think you can push, 
And uh, frequently, almost always, the, the film says, yes, give me more of that. If it, if it kicks back against you, you'll know it, uh, and then you can back off a little bit. But, but always be bold uh, in terms of what Gary was just talking about, in terms of the separation between what you're looking at and what you're hearing. Why do you, Walter, you've talked about sound as the, I think the metaphor you used was that it's the back door through which information comes to the viewer with the with image being coming in through the front door of the eyes. Why do you think, as audience members, we're willing to accept that level of abstraction and that, that differentiation between what we're getting from the track versus what we're getting from the picture? I think, uh, you know, the, the, the audience, without knowing it, is hungry for metaphor uh, that the, of this separation because that tells the audience, the, the film is telling the audience, we need you to complete it. This We're presenting you with a bifurcation here. These things don't quite add up, so we need you, the audience, to, in your own individual ways, to put these things together. A, a film that is perfect uh, in, in a kind of porcelain perfection, says, I'm perfect, I don't need you to complete me. So we're always looking for these sort of dark corners to explore where we are encouraging the audience to make the final uh, uh, nail that glues everything, everything together. I... Uh had had some questions that I'd, I'd made notes of, and it's it's hilarious that you just teed this up. One of the questions was, uh, when have you gone too far? When has the film rejected what you did? Well, I've had directors reject <laughs> I, I I did a movie called Single White Female with Barbe Schroeder. People like Single White Female, cool. Um, and I, 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 it was very psychological and taking from... You know, great other sound work. I did. I did a very psychological interior Roman Polanski esque um, soundtrack to it, and, and I played him back some stuff. And Barbie Schwarger went, "Gary, what you have done with this movie, with the sound, is fantastic." I said, "Oh, thank you. I'm very proud of it myself." He said, "It is too fantastic." <laughs> <laughs> so back it goes. <laughs> so. Um, the, the one time I pushed too far and it was okay, this is, it really depends on your director, was I worked with Dennis Hopper on a, a couple of shows, and one of them was called The Hotspot, which is a, a really uh, strange but fun movie. And Dennis Hopper was the one guy, no matter what, uh, mistakes, like a mistake, you know, feedback, a mistake on the, on the mixing console, he'd go, don't change it, man, you know? <laughs> so he was the one guy that just let it go. So. If anyone wants to see a movie where Dennis Hopper let the soundtrack go, go watch Hotspot. <laughs> but that reminds me of when you worked with Paul Thomas Anderson on Punch Drunk Love. There's that scene where he goes into the bathroom and completely loses it and trashes the bathroom. And the yeah. production track is completely overmodulated. That's it's what we totally, used. It's totally distorted. Right. But that's what ended he up wanted, in the film. There, there's, yeah, he, he wanted, <laughs> he wanted uh, uh, a lot of interesting things with that movie where he, you know, he, he just wanted, that's a movie, again, psychological, the director had it in mind, what he wanted to get inside the mind of Barry Egan, the character that uh, Adam Sandler played. And he was a troubled, violent character. It was very quiet on the outside, but inside, turmoil. So he wanted the soundtrack to reveal this turmoil. So he beats up the bathroom, we'd cut all these regular sound effects beating up the bathroom, and it really is probably the lavalier mic on Adam Sandler during the thing was complete distortion. And it works. And you know, this, as a sound guy, you think, I don't really want to go. There's, there's a case of the director pushing further than I wanted to go. I think that was the story you told me about uh, one of the rocket launches in Canaveral. The best sound was a cheap oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. microphone, dictation microphone out the window of a car. Yeah, one of those little pocket recorders that has a micro cassette. Right. And uh, on the way to a screening, of a temp mix of the film. This is about the space shuttle. It was, a, it was an IMAX film depicting the reality of going into space, but it was going to be done with a thunderous soundtrack. We had recorded the actual shuttle launching. It had been the first time it had been recorded up close, and we went to a, a lot of trouble. But somehow taking those sounds of the shuttle and just laying them in in sync as they were kind of an engineering version of it, you couldn't play it as loud to get the sensation aesthetically that you really wanted. Uh, the, in other words, the way it recorded onto our recording equipment didn't give you the aesthetic you wanted. But on the way to one of the screenings, I was 
dictating some notes, and, and I held the recorder out in the slipstream of air in the car and just blew air into the, into the little tiny crummy mic, which all got compressed and everything. I thought about that when I got back, and I took that and copied it into the system, that, that dis steady distortion, and uh, raised up the low end a whole lot, filtered, and it was the best rocket launch. <laughs> it was better than the real thing, yet it sounded like the real thing. And, right. and up here it did, to the audience. So it became the main component. Saved a lot of trouble doing that. Forgot about that, Walter. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> There's a wonderful thing that I learned from Francis, uh, which is a useful thing, both in terms of actors' performances and sound, which is silent takes six. So you, uh, it only would apply to certain kinds of films, the ordinary people type of film, where you have the actors uh, doing a, uh, an intense dramatic scene in a real environment, and you do take one, and you have some comments, take two, take three, the usual kind of development of actors and the director figuring out what the scene is really about and how to do it. And then on take six, Francis would say, all right, now just do the whole scene, but don't say any dialogue. Feel what you're, what you're express what you're feeling through body language and face. And, um, but, but record the sound at the same time. And so the actors are thrown back into a kind of a more primitive way of expressing emotion uh, without any words. And the camera's picking it all up, and also the microphone is picking up all the footsteps and putting down the salt cellar and you know, turning on the coffee grinder, all, basically all of the Foley sound effects without any pesky dialogue covering, covering them up. So you've got a whole take of location fully perfect, and the actors are learning stuff about the performance, and take seven, where they're suddenly able to talk again, is always a miraculous take, because now they're able to apply the lessons they learned from silence and underline it with, uh, with dialogue. Okay, all you directing students. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Yeah, I, I had that on one film, it was a Western, and the director, we talked him into uh, like on a third or fourth take. Like if three guys rode up on horses and got off and walked into the saloon, it was a real location, so it had dirt, dust, and wood. Uh, we would do it without the dialogue, and you'd get the, them riding up. And even though it wasn't like I mean, perfect sync, it was fantastic bed to use yeah. to build around it uh, rather than doing it all later. Or a wagon would come in, and they'd get out and do something. Right. And if you can do that, if you have the luxury of doing that in a quiet location so you're only getting the natural sound, it's terrific, terrific way to go. But, it, but it, it goes back to that, what we were talking about earlier and what the film talks about in terms of uh, directors who are sensitive to the importance of sound. Because if you've ever been on a set and the poor sound recordist wants to get uh, a wild track of just the dead air, uh, everyone on the set is extremely impatient uh, about wasting this time to record nothing. And so Francis, to, to actually take the time to record an entire take without any dialogue from the studio's point of view is an incredible waste of time. But as you can tell, there, it pays off big dividends, not only in the terms of the actors' performances, but uh, the, the more humble crafts of putting down the salt cellar and other things you get a really wonderful uh, uh, sound effects library generated by the shooting of the film. Yeah, I think there's nothing better than production sound. I mean, there is. I mean, we do everything in feature films. You know, you do you foley everything just because of the international, the the M and E with the foreign. You know, if they're going to take out the dialogue, they'll lose all this other sound that someone might be doing. But there's, I tell my students, too, it's like, you're not going to do a foreign, so don't worry about it. It's like Foley is as hard to make sound real, like in the space, as ADR is, you know? And so it just sounds fake. But to get great production sound, there's nothing better. And I remember cutting on uh, Time Machine, and I had the first reel. And the dialogue editor was, I'm an effects editor, too, and the dialogue editor got real, the supervisor got so mad at me because there were these beautiful horses that came in, like, you know, eight or ten carrying a carriage. And I just went to town. I did all these tracks of horses. And 
he got so mad at me. They're going to be doing this in effect. And I, I know, but they're, they're real sounds. They're, it's the real sound that happened that they recorded. And um, I just think there's nothing more beautiful than great production sound. And also, the other thing just in, about dialogue is not just dialogue, but it's the, someone's breath. You know exactly how somebody feels. Like, our brains know. We don't study it, but actors do, how they breathe. You know if somebody's sad, happy, scared, you know, going to cry. And um, to get the bre someone's breath instead of, um, you know, just thinking it's just the dialogue. Just, you know, it's like that can be more important than. And Sofia Coppola said that in our movie we had to cut that part out. But it's really the space between the words that matter, you know. Which is why silent, I mean, your ordinary people part was really good for that. Not just cleaning up the dialogue, but creating the silences that were needed for a, a dramatic reason. Um, as opposed to just wanting silence. You know, silence is something you have to be brave to put into movies. But silence is made of hearing these little details in a movie. Silence doesn't work as silence. It works as hearing details you wouldn't hear otherwise, like breathing or a little Foley sound. I feel like I'm hearing more silence in films or more quiet moments. Does, are, are you, do you guys see trends happening in tracks these days? I would have thought the opposite in my experience, but then I don't see maybe as many things as I should. But I, I, I generally, in terms of popular cinema, if you want to phrase it since that's more of the realm than I'm operating in, I, I see what I think more films which are sort of wall to wall everything, you know, and almost like they're just checking a box or nobody's brave enough to say, we don't need to score this scene. We want reality or, or a heightened sensation or um, thinking of ways of extending the, the world of sound beyond the frame. A lot of the things talked about in this film. That's my general feeling about it, you know, in terms of what I see and hear, that it's, um, we're, we're, I, if we're talking about an aesthetic, I think we're stalled a bit at the moment. That's... You guys may not agree with me. No, no I, 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 but I, I, I think it's sort of waiting for someone to be brave to step out into the next, uh, you know, evolution of it. Well, that's the history of Hollywood and the history of film is for yeah. that kind of these revolutions and you know. Yeah, there's great craftsmanship. I'm not belittling yeah. it in any way. There's terrific craftsmanship and wonderful libraries of sound, lots of talented people, amazing equipment. I'm not so sure we're taking the time. To plan ahead, you know, in terms of... There's, a, there's a great quote yeah. from Rene Clair uh, in the early days of sound, of sound film, and he said, the soundtrack invented silence. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Because prior to that, every silent film actually had wall-to-wall -wall piano music or orchestra music. Mm -hmm. um, and once you had a soundtrack, you could create zones of silence. And the other... Uh, quote is Bella Balash, who said, in silence, objects look at you with wide open eyes, <laughs> which is a very poetic feeling. But it's true that, that film, which ex is an art form that exists in time, is the, really the only art form that can deal uh, for extended periods of time with silence, uh, because we can see motion uh, and Whereas on the stage, it's very hard. Maybe uh, if you're Samuel Beckett, you can do it. Um, but it's very hard to spend a minute with silence in the theater. And music also, with, unless you're John Cage, it's hard to have uh, silence in, in music for very long. Silence is important, but it has to be in short doses. Whereas in film, you can get away with long stretches of silence. You know, Stanley Kubrick in 2001. And, uh, on every film I work on, I look for moments where, where can we have an unexpected stretch of silence? Because that's really an invitation to invite the audience to fill that silence with their own imagination, which is the best kind of thing that you can do. It's one of the things that's hard about the movie you made, and doing anything about sound or music takes time to develop it. You have to, it's not like showing a photo or, um, it takes time to develop. So I know it's hard to, uh, to demonstrate how sound works without mm -hmm. taking time, because time is the key element to sound. So that was nice. You, you covered a lot, of, uh, a lot of ground. Yeah. And it showed, and, and what was important to me too is, is 
for people interested in sound, what your movie shows is the range of approaches to sound, the, the dramatic range, uh, you know, from you know, very <laughs> intense and psychological to action to inventive to, you know, it, it, it's used for every possible dramatic purpose. Mm -hmm. So that, but that's hard to show without taking time. One of the things I'm curious about, uh, there's, um, you know, you all have, have paid so much attention to gathering field recordings and, and getting naturalistic sounds that then you manipulate uh, subsequent to that. But we don't really have, in our side of the business, we don't have CGI sound. There's really, that, that doesn't work. And I, I wonder if you have any theories as to why we don't seem to accept synthetic sound in the same way that we do with images. Well, it's interesting that the digital revolution hasn't created tools that synthesize dialogue or, or a, a pickup truck blowing up and rolling down a hill. It still makes more sense to go out and gather elements that you can fashion into that. So the, the basic idea of of selecting the right sound for the right moment in a film still starts with exploring. Either if you have, I mean, people explore their libraries because that may be, that's all the time they're given. But going out and uh, having a list of things you're trying to find, you're always going to find some other list. You know, you start out on a day, you're going to do wind and you end up doing, you know, horses or something. Who knows? But you're primed and you're listening with a viewpoint. And those are still very satisfying. Uh, explorations to make if you're allowed to, and there's time and money to do it. So it, it's the same process that Murray Spivak was using, going onto the zoo to get uh, lions and tigers to, to play backwards. That It's still going on um, on films now. I, I like that aspect of it. It's yeah, still no, very... It keeps it real. It keeps it organic. Get you in the sunlight, and uh, it's the rest us, of yeah. your sound work is not... That's you know, why we're all so tan. Yeah, right. <laughs> And uh, it's a documentary aspect of it, which is, I think, important. You, uh, you relate to something as you go out to find something. I mean, I think the closest CGI equivalent of sound is uh, a lot of music tracks today, wonderful tracks, but they're produced out of samples that are created artificially uh, or captured and then recombined artificially. Um, so it's... Uh, M music, maybe, so certain sections of music are the closest you, you can get maybe to CGI sound, but w we always try to make that music, for the most part, sound like real instruments, uh, but it, it can edge into, obviously, electronic music that, that is overtly electronic. Well, do people think artificial voices are getting there? I mean, that's the, I mean, just the CGI hardest thing are faces, because we're more discerning about faces visually, so we're very discerning about the human voice. And I'm, I'm not sure it's there. I don't think it is. But I, I think we we uh, we take sound for granted, but we're also very discerning about it. We know when something is real. Uh, yeah, we're all experts at analyzing, especially the human voice. Yeah. Uh, all of us. So you spend your lives becoming an expert. So it's that's the hardest thing to fool. You know, the, yeah. the experience of the, your your average audience member. Yeah. We should ask Siri what she thinks. <laughs> right. We'll be here for a while. Uh, I, did, uh, I did go out to social media for some questions for, uh, for all of you. And there's one that came back that I absolutely loved, which is a follow-up to something that you were talking about earlier. This is a question from Tony Martinez, who is a wonderful dialogue editor uh, who works here in New York. He, says, he, said, he asked, when has a director vetoed your brilliant idea, but in retrospect you were glad? <laughs> oh boy! I don't know if I was ever glad. <laughs> Plenty of vetoed ideas. That goes with the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have one. Yeah. So in Terminator Two, I've told the story many times. Cameron told me not to tell it, but Terminator Two, the T one thousand morphs liquid metal man, and I had this elaborate, very musical. I would take uh, string bows and then play them on pieces of metal and make these very musical, you know, evolving sounds. They're very sounded synthesized, even though they weren't. And he said, I just want mud. I just want mud. I just get me mud. So I went and I recorded dog food coming out of a dog food can. It just, you know, that cylinder of food that comes out of a can real slowly that comes out. And it's, it was a perfect combination of muddy but metallic. 
and had movement to it. So, you know, my beautiful musical sound for the T-1000 was bad, and mud was better. So that you're talking about that million dollar ILM shot where he yeah, goes through, melts yeah, through the bars. ILM, you know, it'd be like, you know, Dennis Muir and $2.5 million, and me, it's a 35 cent can of dog food, <laughs> <laughs> which, just hold it upside down, that's all you gotta do. I told you James Cameron told me never to tell that story. <laughs> He's tired of hearing that one. So, but it's the magic of cinema. <laughs> it's so easy, anybody can do it. My dog was so hungry, but <laughs> poor dog. Uh, now's the time when we go to the audience for some questions. Well, first of all, th fantastic film. Well worth your work and really nice to have it highlighted. Um, my question is just for Mr. Burt. Um, which was, there was a viral video during the time of Wally -E of a young woman who would cry every time she heard Wally's -E voice during the teaser trailer. And I, 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 do you know this story? I'm, I'm, I remember people showing me the video. Okay, that's what I don't that's know all, much else about it. Yeah. That's what I mean. I, I yeah. mean, yeah, they, they eventually invited her because they said that she was inspiring them to work harder because they wanted to make the movie that the sound promised. Yes. And I just wondered if any of that went through your mind, because there, all she had was a voice that you made. It was the teaser trailer, right, for right. Wally that, yes, um, and she would cry. There was something about Wally's voice made her cry. I don't know. It was flattering, of course, for, I'm speaking for Wally, not, not, not me. But let's be honest, because you're Wally's voice. Yes, yes, that's true. So it's really you. I'm you a, were making I'm, this woman cry. I'm a, I'm a, yeah, right. It doesn't happen that often, uh, not under positive conditions. Just if you could make the audience cry now, that'd be great. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. It's something about the soothing nature of it, I guess, did create it. I, There's I can't a sadness. Explain it. There's a sadness. Maybe to it Wally. was a sadness, uh, a, a cute sadness, almost. Well, much of Wally was uh, baby like sounds, you know? Uh, a young, you know, you know, toddler learning to talk was kind of a, one of the aesthetics there. So I think that triggered something, you know, that caused her to, but I, that's all I really know about it. Sorry. So Dirty Little Secret of Sound Design, question for all three of you, um, and Midge, I don't know if you've done this. Uh, how, how, how many times have you put your own voices in films? All the time. All the time. <laughs> but not his voice all the time. Just. Rarely. <laughs> Rarely, <yeah. laughs> He's the iconoclast of the group. Yeah, but... <laughs> right. His mind is in the movie. That's what it is. It's, it's projected. There was a, actually the one example I'm thinking of is on, on THX 1138, there was a very similar uh, mystery about the, um, this, this uh, rocket launch. We, we had a scene where we went from silence to massive crowd sound. And I recorded all kinds of different crowd sounds at stadiums and I recorded waterfalls and anything that I could think of uh, to add to this mix. Uh, they were all basically different kinds of white noise and pink noise, rushing sounds. And I thought, when I got to the final mix, I thought this is gonna be fantastic. And I pushed all the faders up and the VU meter went way up and it was like there was nothing there. Yes, I was hearing sound, but it had no impact at all. And I thought, what, why is this? Uh, I've got, you know, all of the ingredients are there. Why are they not coming together? And for some mysterious reason, uh, very mysterious, I remembered a recording I made uh, at the Museum of Natural History in San Francisco at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I put the Nagra recorder down at one end of this vast, African Hall, went to the other end and started shouting in uh, a mysterious language to me. <laughs> just kind of stuff. And it echoed all around the room. So I went and got that tape, which I hadn't used anywhere else. I mixed it in with the rushing sounds and suddenly that the addition of that sound, which was like the addition of your uh, the microphone out the window. It congealed everything, and I had to pull all the faders down, uh, and now the VU meters were nowhere near maximum, but it was unbearably loud. And so it has something to do with the way the brain processes sound. I think the, the white noises, like the rocket launch, 
had not enough edges to that. And by the addition of that voice, which had ah, 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 kind of quality to it, those edges made everything congeal. And the, re the result was a, uh, a soundtrack that seemed very loud, although the VU meters didn't say it was that loud. So white, white noise is the enemy of sound. White noise, things that are white noise, sound people know is hard. Crowds, water, right. um, rockets, jets, like C.C. Hall talked about in Top Gun. And so when I did, I did backdraft, which fire also, terrible for sound, because it's right. literally... It's just a steady state. Right? Uh, C.C. Hall in the film mentioned that same thing, that the jets were kind of boring, yeah. so she added these kind of things, monkeys screeches to it yeah. that again congealed the jet sound. You have to have the jet sound, yeah. but you need something else to allow it to kind of, something to condense around. To give it personality. And that's, right. that's a, a trick, uh, a lot of uh, you know, animal sounds are good sweeteners for non-animal things. So in Backdraft 2 I used uh, uh, you know, cougars and weird animal sounds, but my favorite is the Backdraft itself, which was that you open a door and you shouldn't, and the fire comes at you in the spiral, is I, I added Randy Tom's belch. <laughs> <laughs> so it keeps it in the sound designer family, but it, <laughs> it works great. Did he get uh, residuals from SAG? For that? No, he's, he's, he's got three houses now, and it's amazing. <laughs> well, you were telling me you did the same thing. You put animal sounds in the paparazzi flashes and quiz show. Quiz show that they Which when, makes uh, it very when, ominous. When Charles Van Dorn is uh, facing the press after testifying, a lot of the flash bulbs had either a woman's scream or a door slam, I was, you know, you try to think, it's fun and sound to think subliminal, and you can get away with uh, sneaking uh, non-real sounds in, so it, you can put a, a door slam um, and a face punch on a, an old camera flash and get away with it, but it had a, a subliminal effect of what he was feeling. I think what we're saying here is that, you know, you put some kind of sound in there that has a transition in it, and the human voice is a master at transitions. We're all very good impressionists. You can imitate water or boiling water, things, and people will know what you're, you're talking about, even though it's actually, if you recorded it, you may not recognize it, but it's having transitions. And so in each example, you're talking about a steady state sound, which needed to have e e impact in a short amount of time. And a human voice making, or an animal, making a transition from one formant to another tells you something. And we recognize that as communication. So I think you're trying to hear communication. You're trying to decipher, make sense of it. And that's, that's helpful. I'm so sorry, you guys. This is all the time that we have for tonight. No. Oh, Please whoa. give it up for these Just wonderful that. engineers. I hope you enjoyed our conversation on Making Waves with Midge Costin, Walter Murch, Ben Burt, and Gary Rydstrom. Come back again next week uh, when we post another episode. Uh, next week's is going to be with the creative team behind the sound and music of Stranger Things 3. This is Glenn Kaiser signing off from the Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. Thanks. <laughs>